if you're new or this is your first time, um, we have started a series called A Healthy Home. And for about three weeks, we've been talking about this. And we've learned that in order to have a healthy home, and we define home, it doesn't matter if you're single or married, if you're newly wed or you've been married for over 50 years, or if you've got a blended family, or if you have kids or no kids, we want to know how do we honor God with our home. And we learn, we're, we're studying from the book of Proverbs, we've learned that the foundation, according to Proverbs, it, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord. And the Bible defines that really, if you want to use it as reverent awe, it's really worship. It's what it is. So if you are going to have a foundation for the right kind of home, the right kind of life, it begins with worshiping God. It begins with your relationship with God. That's number one, first and foremost. And then we talked about how to have a healthy marriage. Um, and there's a lot in that because, you know, some people are married, some people are not. Some people have been married for a very long time and others have not. Uh, but how do you do that? So we talked about that. And then last week we talked about healthy kids. What does it mean to be able to discipline your kids in a way that is for their good and for God's glory? And uh, so if you miss that and you'd like to go back and watch that, you can watch it online. Those of you online that are watching today, maybe you haven't seen it yet, go online and watch that. It'll be a very helpful message for you. Now, in the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about healthy communication. How do you communicate? Not just in marriage, but how do you communicate overall? Do you not agree that we live in a culture that has difficulty communicating, especially communicating with kindness? I mean, the fact is we need to know what the Bible says about healthy communication. We're going to talk about the foundation of thankfulness. Uh, we'll talk about that on Thanksgiving weekend um, and so there are a lot of things we're talking about. Today, I want to talk to you about something that's very important, uh, something that every one of us needs to know about, no matter what your income level is, uh, if you're retired or starting out in your career, we want to talk about what the Bible says about healthy money, healthy money. Now, I heard about a guy that was uh, a country store owner. You ever been to one of those country stores? I used to love going to those. Well, there's this old country store owner, and uh, he was a Christian, and he was known for quoting a Bible verse every time he rang up a customer. So if there was a young woman coming in, he'd say, he'd ring it up, and he'd say, if she was coming in with a child, children, Psalm 127 says, children are a gift from the Lord. And then if a young couple came in, he would say, Psalms says that... Um, that a wife is a gift from the Lord. Blessed is the man that has discovered that. And more, he was just, every time somebody would come in, he'd, he'd quote a Bible verse. And uh, finally, there was this guy that came in one day, and he was a very rich, obnoxious, wealthy man. In fact, he had just bought a, a horse that he was claiming that was going to win the Kentucky Derby. And so everywhere he went, he'd talk about his horse. And he always said, the only uh, thing that I'll ever buy for my horse is the very best. Nothing cheap, nothing that's not the best quality for my horse. Because my horse is going to win the Kentucky Derby one day. Well, he was, like I said, kind of obnoxious about it. And he was in this country store that day and bragging about his horse. And the, the owner of the store looked at him. He said, well, sir, what it seems like to me that you need is a horse blanket. And the guy said, okay. So he goes back into the, uh, the storage area, and he finds one and only one dusty old horse blanket. That's all he had. And he came out, and he said to the guy, he said, here's my horse blanket. That'll be $50. The rich guy, he was disgusted. He said, I told you I don't want any junk, nothing but the best for my horse. The guy said, hold on, hold on. I, I think I understand you a little better now. Let me go back and see what else I've got. We only had one blanket, so he goes back in the back again, and uh, he brings out the same exact blanket, dusted it off a little bit. He said, sir, uh, I found something better. Maybe you would like this one. This blanket will be $500. 
And the obnoxious, rich horse owner, he said, Mister, I told you, I don't take junk. If you don't have anything better than that, I'm leaving. He said, finally, sir, I understand you. Hold on just a second. He goes back to the back. The exact same horse blanket. He folds it gently and gingerly, and he brings it out like he's bringing out, you know, Simba and the Lion King, you know, and he's just like, oh, you know. And um, he says, sir, this is the best I've got. If you don't want this, you'll have to go somewhere else. He said, well, how much is that blanket? He said, sir, this blanket is $5,000. And the guy says, finally, you're bringing me the best. And the guy purchases this cheap old horse blanket for $5,000. Well, everybody in the store knew that the guy normally quoted a Bible verse every time he rang up a customer. They were like, what is he going to say this time? The, the guy, as he is ringing up this customer, he suddenly gets a grin on his face. He says, Matthew says, a stranger came in to me, and I took him in. <laughs> Well, we don't want you to get taken in. We want you to know what the Bible actually says about having healthy money. Did you know that you can have healthy money? And obviously, there's nothing healthy or unhealthy about a piece of paper or what the money represents. But you can have the healthy attitude toward money. And not only does it give you the right attitude, but it actually will help you in your physical health as well. The Bible is pretty clear about that. So I want to talk to you about how to... Look at your money in a way that God wants us to. Um, And I've got to tell you this. One of the difficulties as a pastor, when you have a congregation that has some young people and some older people, you've got to be able to talk in a way that applies Scripture to everyone wherever they are. And I do my best to try to do that because scriptural principles are eternal. It doesn't matter how old you are. And, uh, but that is a challenge because we have people in our church, pretty obvious, that are retired. And so when it comes to the making of the money, uh, investing of your money, you're living on your previous choices. You're living on your previous decisions, okay? And then there are others that are, you're young and you're getting started out and you have young kids or maybe you have teenagers and you're still trying to find that balance. You're still trying to find what do I do to be able to not only retire one day, but to provide for my family. And for those of you that are on a fixed income, or even if you're not on a fixed income, you know that inflation sometimes makes it difficult. And sometimes we struggle when it comes uh, to dealing with our money. But what does the Bible say about how you can have the right attitude toward money, you can have healthy money, you can do the right thing and not be obsessed over it and not worry about it. What can you do that's scriptural that will help you no matter what phase of life you're in? Well, we're looking in the book of Proverbs for this entire series. So Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 10. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh. You say, well, how does the world does that do? We'll explain that in a moment. And it will be refreshment to your bones. Do you ever look at your bank account and get refreshed? Or do you ever look at your bank account and get worried? The Bible says you can have the right attitude. You can have refreshment. In other words, that means you're relaxed. You're not worried. You're trusting in the Lord. Then he says, here's how you do this. He says, honor the Lord. Everybody say honor. Honor. Honor the Lord. You want to have refreshment when it comes to looking at your calendar and you know you got more month left than you do money left for the month. You want to be able to navigate that. You want to be able to handle that. Honor 
the Lord. With what? With your wealth. In other words, your stuff, your job, your money. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits. This is an important thing because you don't actually honor the Lord until you put the first fruits first. The Bible is filled with explanations about what it means to have the first fruits. In the Old Testament, the first was always God's. And so this is what it brings to mind that when you give God the first fruits, that he is first in the priority, that he gets honored by putting him first. He uh, honor him with your wealth and the first fruits of all your produce. And then, then, now once again, this is a very powerful promise. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. I don't know about you, but I like that metaphor right there. I like the idea of overflow. Now, I don't want my toilet to overflow, but I do want my joy to overflow. I I want my money to overflow. I want my blessings to overflow. And, And the idea here is that God says there is a way that you can be healthy in your attitude, in your finances, in your money when you put God first in your life. That's what he says. So we are going to talk about some very practical things to do with your money next week, okay? We're going to talk about some money management tools and how to get the most out of it. There is a way to get the most out of your money, okay? And we're not talking about investment strategy. I'm not trying to sell you insurance, okay? But what I do want you to understand is that everybody... No matter how much you make or how little you make, there are some principles you can follow that will bring blessing into your life. And so we'll talk about that next week. But today, I want to talk to you about healthy money. What does God bless? How do you have healthy money? How do you have blessed money? How does God bless you in the area of your finances? Well, number one is this. God blesses faith. God blesses faith. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, there he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Now, that's a very clear instruction for us. In other words, God says, you got to have faith. With all your heart means to trust him with your mind. In other words, the things you think about. You ever get your mind set on things that are not right? Now, once again, I'm not suggesting that if you have a desire to have a new car, that that's wrong. Or if you want, you know, to refresh your house or remodel your house or that you want to be able to retire a few years early. Uh, I'm not, there, there is nothing in scripture that says that these things are wrong, okay? What it talks about, what is wrong is when we have the wrong attitude toward money. I hear a lot of people misquote Uh, the New Testament, when they say money is the root of all evil. Well, that's not what the Bible says at all. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And that word in the Greek language in the New Testament, it means an inordinate desire, an inordinate lust, an overwhelming um, desire that is not godly. In other words, it goes along with what Jesus said, He said, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Now, you probably know this, but mammon was the Babylonian god of wealth, okay? And so when Jesus said, you can't serve God and mammon, he was really showing that you cannot worship God and money at the same time. He said, well, I don't worship money. Well, let let me tell you what that means when Jesus said, don't worship mammon that Babylonian god of wealth. Here's what mammon represented. It represented, um, excuse me, it represented, I guess I should stop drinking before I get up uh, every Sunday morning to preach. <laughs> Communion wine, all right, you know, anybody? All right, so. Um, but no, the, the idea that was being expressed by Jesus was that there, in, in the Babylonian god of mammon was where they found their significance. It was where they found their supply, their provision. 
Uh, it was where they found their happiness. And you know what Jesus was saying? He said, this is stuff that only God can do. You, you can't find happiness in money. Now, we've all heard that, but we all still are happy when we have money, right? So the Bible's not saying that you um, shouldn't have money. It's not saying that at all. But in other words, your significance, uh, you, you are more important than your bottom line. Uh, your worth is not determined by your, uh, your net worth. Your self-worth is not determined by your net worth. And this is what he's saying. So he says, trust in the Lord. This idea we're to trust him with our mind, uh, our will. That also means, you know what your will is? Your will is your decision making. So I'm to trust him in my mind. I'm to get my mind set on the Lord. But I'm also to trust him in my decision making. Do you know that a lot of scripture comes down to the decisions that you make? In other words, whether or not you get blessed in life, it comes down to whether or not you make the right choices. You can choose to serve God or you can choose not to serve God. This goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You know this. Remember what God told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? He said, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, you know, the serpent, Satan, tempted them. He said, oh, God knows that in that day that you eat of that, you're going to be like God. You're going to be in the place of God. And by the way, do we not like to be in the place of God in our life? We like to be in control. Control for most of the decisions in our life is simply an illusion. I mean, we don't really control much at all, do we? We don't control how long we're going to live. We don't control the economy. We don't control anything hardly. But you can control the choices that you make. And, and this is what he's saying. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. In other words, trust him with your mind. What do you have your mind set on? Trust him with your will or your decision-making ability, your thinking, your understanding, and to trust him with your emotions. The idea, the word heart there, uh, is the same concept that we get the word soul from. Trust the Lord with your heart. Trust the Lord with your soul. In other words, you're a complete person. You trust him with your, your mind your will, your decision-making ability, and your emotions. Man, you ever struggle with your emotions, especially when it, becomes, when it comes to money? I know I do. I mean, the fact is, you see something that you just so desperately want. You know you don't need it. You know you can't afford it, but you want it. Anybody ever been there? I mean, there have been so many times that I've um, not completely trusted the Lord when it comes to finances. I remember one time I wanted to get a blower now the, to, for my yard, okay? Now, the problem was I already had a blower, and it was a good blower, and it worked fine. There was nothing wrong with that blower, but for some reason, I don't know why, I thought what I needed was two blowers because in my mind, what I wanted to do, instead of like making two passes to blow off the grass off of my sidewalk, I could have a blower in each hand, all right, <laughs> like, like, like an idiot walking down there, and I'm like, just blowing the sidewalk off. Now, fortunately, that wasn't a huge financial crisis for me, but it's just an example that often we fail to trust God with our emotions. In other words, we fail to give it to Him. And, and please don't misunderstand. God's not against buying a blower. Okay? He's not against you getting the right kind of equipment to do your lawn and make it look nice. He's not against you getting a new car. He's not against you having a nice house. Okay? The problem is when we trust in our own understanding... Notice the parallel here. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. That's our own way of thinking. That's our own decision-making, if you will. 
when we say we're looking at life the way everyone else does. Don't lean on your own understanding. It means don't support yourself with human understanding. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't learn or seek wisdom? Does that mean you should never read a book? Does that mean you should never uh, watch a financial seminar to learn how to manage your money or how to invest? No, that's not what that means. But it means uh, that you should seek wisdom from God and don't trust in yourself. In other words, I could say it this way. Faith trumps facts. Now, I'm going to say that again because if you don't get anything I say today but this, get this. Faith trumps facts. You say, does God want me to ignore evidence? No, he does not. But the truth is, he wants you to follow him. Some of you know that my dad retired as a pastor a number of years ago. And uh, before he became the founding pastor of the church that he pastored in North Carolina, uh, he and my mother went to Mexico as missionaries for a few years. And before he did that, he had to, and some of you don't know what this means, but he had to go and raise money. It was called deputation. I don't know why they call it that. But he would go from different church to different church, and he would present the vision that he had, the work he was going to do, and that church would decide whether or not they were going to give him monthly support to be a missionary. And so my dad was in this church in North Carolina, and um, he went, and they had this uh, conference, this, uh, this gathering of missionaries, and they were talking about missions and raising money and so forth. So my dad went to this church. He had been invited by them. They were thinking about possibly giving him monthly support to help him to go to the mission field. Well, they didn't, but he got there, and it was a ways away, and he didn't have much money. He only had $25, and he had to buy gas. And he was supposed to get a meal on the way home. At least in his mind, he wouldn't starve to death before he got home. But he wanted to get something to eat. And he wanted to fill up his car with gas. Now, the problem was he only had $25. And I'll never forget him telling me this story, this idea of faith trumping facts, I think illustrates this. My dad said that while he was there, and even though this church didn't give him any support, they did not give him an offering. They didn't even cover his cost of getting there, even though they had invited him. He felt like that when it came time for the offering, they were raising money for this other missionary. My dad said he felt like the Lord spoke to him about giving his $25. And he's like, well, Lord, how am I going to get home? What if I run out of gas on the way home? I won't be able to stop at Shoney's. That was back in the day when they stopped at Shoney's, all right? And he was like kind of arguing with the Lord. You ever do that? God ever lead you to do something? You're like, <laughs> you're leaning on your own understanding. Well, I can't do that. I mean, I can't afford that. Well, to make a long story short, he did. He had no money to get home. He had no money to buy gas. And he gave his last $25. So after the service, he just kind of standing in the back, hoping that maybe somebody would invite him to eat supper with him, and maybe somebody somehow would give him enough money to get home. And I'll never forget him telling me this story about faith trumping facts, about obeying God. This is the way to build your faith. This is the way that you and I, we get blessed money in our life. It's when we live by faith. He was standing in the back of the church, people were leaving. He had no idea if he was going to even speak to anybody or not. And he said, this, this little old man, he just kind of shuffled up to him after the service, you know. And he's, he's like, he, he, he looked at my dad. He said, are you that missionary? He said, yes, sir, I am. He said, you know, the Lord just laid on my heart to give you a little something. And he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a check for $1,000 and gave it to my dad. Now, why do I tell you that story? Because I want you to know that God blesses faith. 
You want blessed money? You want money that God is going to help you with? It begins with faith. It begins with faith. Until you're willing to not put your trust in yourself, in your money, you'll never know what it's like to have blessed money. Now, I'm not saying you won't be able to earn money. Do we know people that are wealthy that are not Christians? Of course. So God's not saying that. But he's saying that what you need if you're going to have blessed money, if you're going to have money that God helps you with, is you've got to have faith. Number two, God blesses it when I prioritize the giver more than the gift. Now, this is a hard one because here's the truth. It's easy to prioritize the gift more than the giver. You know God is the giver, right? Okay. So... Um, do you ever get obsessed with the gift? You ever get obsessed with what's in your bank account or what you own or what you can surmise and forecast about the future of your investments? And once again, the Bible does not tell us that it's wrong to invest. In fact, quite the opposite. It tells us to invest. And it tells us how to manage our money. But I want you to read with me again what he said, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Now that word acknowledge is an interesting word. Um, when we acknowledge God, it means to know him. So let's read it this way because uh, this word is translated 645 times as the word know in the Old Testament. Here's what, read it this way. In all your ways, know him. In all your ways, know him, and he'll clear the way. In all your ways, get to know him. He'll give you straight paths. Doesn't mean that you won't have trouble. Doesn't mean that everything's going to be easy. Doesn't mean you're going to win the lottery every time you play it, okay? What it means is, that when you get to know God, in other words, you get to fellowship with Him, that you are more and more aware of His promises. The more you acknowledge God, the more you lean on His promises. The more you trust Him, the more you lean on His promises. The more you lean on His promises, guess what? You have less stress. You have less worry. You have more freedom. You see, this is what God promises, uh, that we are to prioritize the giver more than the gift. And when we do, he, he blesses us. We're to have faith. And then finally, number three, God blesses it when I put him first. It's interesting that in this brief passage that we read today, he said, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits." of all your produce. To honor means to be heavy or weighty. I know that sounds weird. What, is that, what in the world does that mean? In other words, honoring God means that you put considerable weight into this. That this is not something that you just do off the cuff. This is not some decision you make because you watched um, some celebrity on television talk about the little puppies that are suffering and you're going to be like, oh, I got to give. In the eye. Okay, you know. Anybody ever watch that and think, maybe you ought to back off a little bit, Jack. You know, that, that's a little heavy-handed, all right? So he's not talking about that when you honor him, that it's a, a decision that you make just emotionally. That it's a decision that you make lightly. He says, we are to honor him. We're to give weight to it. This is... Another way of saying that you believe in this, that it's a priority. I put weight into this. When I honor the Lord with my possessions, with my wealth, with the first fruits, what does that communicate? That I've given God the priority in my life. The first fruits um, always show us that God is first. You say, well, how do I put God first and do the first fruits? in my finances. Well, the Bible is pretty clear about it, that we give him the first part. 
Did you know that in Scripture that the first is always supposed to be God's? And what that does for us is it opens up God's blessings. You see, how so? Well, uh, in the Old Testament, for example, when uh, you remember Abraham, right? Uh, When Abraham uh, gave the tithe, which, by the way, was 500 years before the law of Moses came out, when Abraham gave the tithe, you know why he did that? He, you know who he gave it to? He gave it to Melchizedek, who was a priest. And by the way, you read in the book of Hebrews, I personally believe that Melchizedek, because uh, it says he was an eternal priest with no beginning or no end, um, I believe that was an Old Testament personification of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ himself um, a theophany, if you will. It was an appearance of God. So get the picture. Abraham, he's you know, fighting this battle, and God blesses him. And what does he do? He gives Melchizedek the first part, the tithe. You know what tithe means? It just simply means a tenth. It really means the first tenth. And so what he did was, in the Old Testament, when you put that first tenth, um, that represented the whole. That represented everything. So when I put God first, I give him the tithe. Okay, that's really what it is. And so, by the way, another reason why I believe that was Melchizedek, uh, or that was Jesus, uh, that Melchizedek was Jesus, was because if you look at what Melchizedek brought, Abraham brought the tithe, and what did Melchizedek bring? He brought the bread and the wine. You say, what is that? You ever heard of communion? You ever heard of what Jesus said? That it is my body and my blood. And, and the point is this, and I think it's purely, uh, it, it's clearly metaphorical. That when I put God first, he pours out the blessings that he promises through salvation. Now, am I saying that if you don't tithe, you're not saved? That's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, some of you don't have the faith yet to do the tithe. And I get it. It doesn't mean that you're not blessed. When you're saved, you're blessed. Okay, I want you to know that. Uh, But according to Malachi, your money's not blessed. And when you tithe, what does he do? He lifts the curse off of that. And so the idea here is that God wants the priority in my life. The first always belongs to God. It always acknowledges that God owns everything and that I am simply a steward. That's all it means. And it shows the belief that God is generous. You see, when I, because let's be honest, from a mathematical standpoint, it doesn't make sense. The Bible says, you know, put him first and he's going to, Supply all your needs. Bring the tithe, and he's going to bless. Well, did anybody here graduated from middle school math? I mean, you know that if I give 10%, 90% is less than 100%. I mean, that's just natural, right? But remember, he warns us, don't lean on your own understanding, but acknowledge him. And what does that mean? Well, I'm going to wrap this up. But basically, he's simply saying that if you want blessed money, if you want God to work for you, yes, it doesn't seem to make sense, but ask any person that has practiced tithing and they will tell you that it works. I tell people this. I hear some people say, I can't afford to tithe. And I get that. I understand that. I mean, the fact is, the economy's tight, you got kids, you got bills to pay. I get that, okay? But here's what I always say, I can't afford not to. You say, why would you say that? Because God always promises to bless, to lift the curse off of my money. Now, I'm already blessed, and so are you if you're a believer, okay? Okay? So you're not working for God's blessing, but you're wanting God to work on your behalf with your money. And here's what I know. 100 times out of 100, I believe this to be true. 90% of my money, which is blessed, goes a lot farther than 100% of my money, which is cursed. And so 
the idea is God blesses me when I put him first. Well, let me just say this. Um, I'll tell you a story, a part of a story that I've told before. Um, there was a missionary that came to the church that I was attending when I was a teenager. And uh, I had felt God had called me to the ministry. And I was planning on going off to Bible college. And so I'd worked and saved my money. And uh, I had enough money for my entire first year, two semesters of Bible college, completely paid for. And um, there was this missionary that came and, and um, he told the story about building this church. And there was a man there at this church that didn't even have the proper tools. And he literally put uh, the stucco on the walls of this church with his bare hands. That's all he had. He didn't have the tools. And God so worked in my heart when this missionary told this story. Once again, I was only 17 years old. And God clearly spoke to my heart. He said, you need to empty out your bank account. And I'm like, uh, hello, uh, bad connection. Uh, you need to call later because I don't understand what you're saying. Well, he wouldn't let go of me, wouldn't let go of my heart. And so eventually I ended up and I gave everything that I had in that bank account for my first year of college. And I gave it all. And to be honest with you, I was a little concerned because I'd saved all my money. I didn't know if I was going to be able to go to college or not. I didn't know if I was going to be able to pay for it. And the very next week, I mean the very next week, I got a phone call from a man in Florida that I'd never met before. I'd never even heard his name before. And he told me, that all four years of my college were going to be paid for. And from that day forward, I thought, and I've even told this story in this vein before, uh, that I received God's blessings financially. And it's true, I did, okay, because I obeyed him. Once again, that was above the tithe. That wasn't a tithe, okay. That was I gave it all. But you know what I failed to see until just recently? That yes, God blessed me. Yes, God supplied my need. But that was not what he wanted. That was not only what he wanted to do with that. With my obedience. From that decision, I was able to, while I was in college, minister in over 400 churches in nearly every state in the United States of America. I mean, here I was a 17, 18-year-old kid going in front of these churches and speaking, and I'm like, I would never have had that opportunity had I not followed the Lord. And I was thinking about it further. It was during that ministry that the greatest blessing other than my salvation, the greatest blessing of my life happened to me. I met a pretty blonde-headed, sparkly young woman, and her name is Kim. And we got married. And I will say this, there is no way I would be in the ministry today apart from her. There's no way I would have survived apart from her. There's no way that God would have used me like he has apart from her. And what am I saying is that, you know, I was concerned about the money, but God was concerned about the man. And more than God is concerned about your money, he's concerned about you. And he wants to use you, but you got to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us to trust you, help us to believe in you, help us to follow you. And God, I pray that you would just bless us today. Now, before we finish our prayer, I wonder if there would be anybody that would say, Pastor, I've got, I've got some issues I'd like for you to pray for. No one looking at me. But you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me about my money. Maybe it's about a decision you're making. Maybe it's about saving money. Maybe it's about getting out of debt. Maybe it's about getting a job or a raise or being able to manage your money. But you say, I've got some financial things I'd like you to pray for. Would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? All right. Then 
Well, let, let me pray about that. Lord, I pray for everyone here, God, that you would help them to get out of debt, help them to honor you with, uh, by putting you in the first fruits. God, I pray that you bless them, use them, and then I pray that you'd help them. And before I finish my prayer, I wonder if you'd say, Pastor, I need salvation. I need to be saved. I've not been saved. Those of you watching online as well. Maybe today you would say something like this to God. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to be my Savior today. Right now. By faith, I'm trusting you. If you'll say that today, use that next step card and mark it on there. There'll be a prayer team member up here at the front uh, after the service, and you can come pray with them, and they can help you with that. Or if you're online, you can fill out the online uh, survey and let us know. But today, I hope you will, whatever your next step is, take that next step. Maybe it's about getting right in your finances, paying off some debt, controlling your spending, tithing, whatever it is. Maybe it's about joining the church, or maybe it's about being baptized, or maybe your next step is about starting to serve. Whatever it is, I hope that you will give that next step to the Lord. Father, help us today, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to ask our ushers to go ahead and come, and today, if you would like to give physically in the offering, uh, check or cash, um, land, deeds, car, whatever, okay? You can give whatever you want. Go ahead and start passing that, guys, if you will. Uh, you can do that at this time. And uh, please put in your next step card, your next step card. And that way we'll have a record of your um, decision, your prayer request, your visit, whatever it is. I have some um, next step brochures that I'd like to give away today. How many of you have been through, not necessarily since we've been here at this building, but you've been through the next step class or some form of it before? Raise your hand. Okay. How many have not been through it? Okay. A few of you. Okay. Here's what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to stop by on the way out and see me. I've got some of these brochures and I want to give you that. And uh, that way uh, you'll be able to have the information that you need to make a good, wise choice, okay? I do know this. God wants you to be connected. God didn't design you to be alone, and I'm not talking about romantically, but God designed you to have fellowship with other people, with other Christians, and the primary way we do that is not over football and beer and chips, okay? That's not, that's not biblical definition of fellowship. Is it Hanging out, yes, okay? And if you enjoy doing that, great, okay? But that's not, the, the word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia. You say, why would I care about that? It means to come alongside of. Anybody ever been through a difficult, dark time in your life and you need somebody alongside of you? Anybody ever had a problem that you were facing and you felt all alone and you need somebody to come alongside of you, put their arm around your shoulder? That's the way that you and I are designed by God. And so anyway, if you will, stop by and see me, and I'll, I'll get you connected, okay? All right, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. We will see you next week.